this is fun. I had no idea this church was here. I could watch it. That close. And especially if it's kind of an upstart church in a uh, elementary school. Uh, it's all these young families and kids running everywhere. I mean, we got this, this amazing wisdom retirement community here. <laughs> wow. I, I, I am thoroughly intrigued. Plus, I noticed something, and I don't know how you pulled this off. And I promise not to tell. <laughs> Some of you may not know what this is, but it's a special cup. It's a device that keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. It's very lightweight and very inexpensive to produce. Therefore, in California, it's mostly banned. <laughs> but you have them at your coffee table. You! You are a free people! <laughs> I'm saving this. Show it to my grandkids. <clears throat> uh, so I did, I did bring some books along. I didn't bring nearly enough. I didn't think, I thought on you know, Labor Day weekend people would be out you know, water skiing or something. But you know, I'm glad you're here. Uh, and and uh, the, the featured book this morning is really the, the topic of uh, my message, Fearless Prayer, Why We Don't Ask and Why We Should. It's funny because I wanted people so badly to read this that I made it a little book. <laughs> I didn't want them to be off put by that. Uh, and I'll talk more about that, but uh, I brought a few of those. I have a novel that I wrote called Five Sacred Crossings. This has been my best-selling book over the last you know, 15, 20 years. It's still, still going strong. And guess what? We are at September 1st, but this is Labor Day weekend, so it's still considered uh, summer, as far as I'm concerned. In the last days of summer. So uh, this could still be beach reading. <laughs> uh, so it's a novel, and I'm an academic person, and I've written academic books, and uh, yeah, nobody reads those. So <laughs> I decided to write a novel, and it's, it's gone uh, wonderfully over the years. So uh, check that out. And, and somebody asked me, so why do you have a Lee Strobel book on your table? Well, uh, he, uh, he actually featured me in this book. It's, it's called The Case for Grace. It's actually, some, some uh, reviewers have called this his best book of the Case for series. And this one's The Case for Grace. Uh, why am I carrying it around? Because he features me in chapter four. This is about, this book basically is about wild stories of conversion and God's uh, gracious hand on people's lives, guiding them and, and doing you know, miraculous things in their lives. So he put me in, I, I'm featured in chapter four, which is right between the drug addict and the executioner. <laughs> I can figure out why I'm in there. Enough of that. I was stuck on the East Coast one time. I don't remember the exact city, but I was going to transfer planes in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, at Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. You know, like the busiest airport on the planet or maybe even in the solar system. You know, it just, it's so busy there. And so it was a little bit dicey booking through that airport in the first place, but I had to in Los Angeles. I had some important ministry things going. I was praying about it. I had some friends praying about it. You know, it was very important that I get there. And, uh, and yet I knew it was going to be a little bit dicey going through that airport, especially when I saw a weather report and there were giant thunderstorms coming in. And, oh, no, this is bad. So, um, you know, the, the last resort of a scoundrel, I, I prayed you know, very seriously. God, you got to get me there. I think you set this up. Now, help, God. So the, the plane I'm supposed to get on in Atlanta, it's, it's already like an hour or more late, you know, and, you know, the, and you know what happened. The, the pilots say, oh, yeah, we're going to try to make it, make it ground in the air. Oh, what do they do? They, like, stomp on the gas? <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was skeptical of that. And as the clock kept ticking, I was really uh, bummed, bummed out. Uh, so uh, it, it came time to get on the plane, and I uh, 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 so they were they were loading it up, and they and somebody came by and said, uh, uh, "Dr. Hazen, we're looking for Dr. Hazen." And that's me. They said, "Come with me." There was a woman uh, wearing all black and had a, had a bit of a, a, some sort of Asian accent. And she had a partner who didn't say a word. And they were walking like this. 
you know, just, just very quickly, just shooting around. And, and they waved me over to the uh, a door in the gateway, in the jetway to the plane. They open the door. I'm not exactly authorized to do this, so I'm following them, these, these ladies dressed in black, out to the jetway. I walk down the jetway. We're on a live tarmac at Jackson, Hartfield's Jackson International Airport, and uh, they open the hatch to a sleek black uh, uh, Porsche Cayenne SUV. <laughs> they grabbed the suitcase out of my hand, put it in the back. Uh, they folded the umbrella they were holding over my head. And uh, they leapt into the car, and they got me in, they, they made sure I was buckled up, and they took off. <laughs> we're driving on live taxiways. And there's these whoopy dudes we're going over. And gee, they're driving clear to the other end of the airport. Uh, and I had no idea what was going on. You know, I didn't know if, they were, if it was uh, North Korean, you know, <laughs> spies. <laughs> Maybe a, a, a librarian that's a little bit upset with me for not returning lots of books. Uh, I didn't know. But, so then they pull up next to this uh, uh, gleaming 750s, Delta 757 ready to take off, you know? And they, they swept me up the stairs. They, they brought me around the corner of the jetway. Uh, I was only two steps away from walking right into the plane. I turned left again, walked right into first class, and sat on an aisle seat in first class. They took my bag, put it in the overhead. And the first thing anybody had said to me during this whole time was the, was the uh, flight attendant who said, sir, would you like something to drink before we take off? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll time later explain, but uh, I pray that would happen. <laughs> oh my gosh, and I've seen God do way crazier things than that, and I know you have too. This, we can just break this open and all start telling our stories. And we need to do that more often because uh, God is constantly doing crazy things in response to our prayers. He's so attentive and so wonderful. And my message this morning is going to be on John chapter 15, uh, especially verse 7. John chapter 15, verse 7. Uh, I was minding my own business, reading my Bible in my comfortable Bible reading chair in my home office. I'm an early bird. Everybody else is sleeping in the family. And I'm, uh, I have a lot, a lot of quiet time to read the Bible. And I love doing that in the morning. And I, I was in the Gospel of John. That's always a big treat, you know. Sometimes I have to slog through those other books of the Bible to get to the Gospel of John. I made it. And so I'm in the middle somewhere in chapter 15. And I read this verse. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 7. Here's what it says. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, I've read that a lot of times. I have read that a lot of times. And I, I, uh, it just never really quite struck me in the right way before. But I think the, the Holy Spirit was getting like a woodpecker on my head going, you know, Pay attention to this one, Hazen. you, you got to pay attention to this. Because I've just read that and go, not sure what all that means. It's one of those mysterious things Jesus says, and then he moves on. Uh, I wasn't going to move on this time. Actually, I, I think God the Holy Spirit was not going to let me move on this time. He wanted me to figure out what this said. That actually set me on a course of kind of informal research for several years, where any Bible teacher or pastor or elder or, you know, a uh, really smart Christian person, I'd always ask them about that particular verse and what they thought about it. And I got all kinds of wild responses, you know. In fact, I remember there was one pastor in North Carolina, he goes, I don't know what to say about that one. Uh, you know, I always figured you had to be within spitting distance of Jesus to make all that stuff happen. <laughs> Not sure what he meant by all that, but uh, that was the wisdom from North Carolina. Uh, so I, I asked a lot of people what this meant, and what, what I discovered was this, a lot of people avoid this verse like the plague. They really don't know what to do with it, how it really plays out. They don't, it doesn't play out in a, any real way in their lives, and it doesn't play out in any real way in anybody's life, anybody's life that they know. So it's a, it's a bit problematic. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, I came up with a phrase for this. It, this, this verse dies the death of a thousand qualifications. 
Everybody I seem to talk to had, you know, a whole list of qualifications. And you, usually starting out with Hazen, you got to be careful with that first. Well, I don't want to be careful with that first. I want to find out. That sounds pretty juicy. I mean, I want to know something more about that. Yeah, but you got to be careful with that. You know, there's, there's people who treat that verse in a, in a crazy fashion. And we'll, and we'll get to that. But one more time. John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And I'm claiming that dies the death of a thousand qualifications. We don't really take that seriously uh, because it just sounds too crazy. Well, uh, there are all kinds of uh, objections to this. And there's all kinds of reasons why people would be careful with this verse. Uh, for instance, uh, like I said, we had the pastor from North Carolina. You know, he, his explanation was, I, I think he had to be right there next to Jesus to be able to, you know, get that stuff going, or actually witness it or experience it. Uh, another low-level objection, I call it, would be, uh, one fellow said that, uh, you know, I'm not, I think that's really for, like, you know, like, real saints, you know, or, or clergy who are really hitting it out of the park. All right, I was listening to anything they had to tell me. One guy said, I think that's for the super mature. Yeah. And uh, another one, not a great response. He, one pastor said, uh, I tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the honesty. But let me give you a few other barriers that sit in front of our deep understanding of this passage. Because this is, this is a very cool passage. If Jesus really spoke this and, really, and it really seems to mean what he it says, uh, I want a lot of that in my life. So the first barrier that stands between us and really understanding what this verse can mean in our lives is, uh, uh, is the, uh, the word faith movement, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. That was one of the biggest objections I got when I mentioned this particular passage to people. Oh, Hazen, you got to be careful with that because you know those, you know the kind of crazier Christians, you know, that you see on uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network and so on, you know? Yeah. They go, well, that's, that's one of their favorite verses. You know? So you've got to really watch out for that. And, and I know a little bit about what they're talking about. I've, I'm not going to go into it formally here, but I've studied that a little bit. In fact, just the other morning, my wife was out of town, and I was up early, and I was ch channel surfing. And I landed on this fellow. He was, he was preaching to a big room of people, and right into the TV camera, and he was going after people for a $1,000 seed gift, you know? That if they were to give that 1000 bucks, then everything, uh, everything they wanted from God would just suddenly open up, you know? Oh, that's, that's really what they're talking about. It's that kind of thing that's, that's the problem. So when I watch that on television or I read about it, um, I say, oh, I kind of want to stay arm's length from that movement because... I'm not sure that's really where God wants us to be. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that he's some sort of cosmic vending machine. If you put in a couple of quarters, you're automatically going to get the thing you're asking for. You're going to have health, wealth, and prosperity, and so on. I just don't think that's how it works. And it has uh, caused mainstream uh, Christians, mainstream evangelicals, mainstream Bible readers, to, to shy away from this verse because of the abuse it receives from the health, wealth, and prosperity movement. So that's, that's an objection that's actually real. In fact, uh, quick, quick side story. So this book is called Fearless Prayer, Why We Don't Ask and Why We Should. The working title that actually intrigued the publisher about this was simply this, Ask for Anything and It Will Be Done For You. Which, by the way, is from the Gospel of John directly. You know, I thought, hey, I'll, you know, I'll just use that as a title. Uh, when they got towards the point of publishing, actually printing the book, they, they gathered their marketing team at the publishing house. They got me on the phone, and they all, they all talked to me. They go, hey, we're, we're having second thoughts about the title of the book, you know. Uh, titling it something, ask for anything, and it will be done for you. People are going to look at that and think, this is part of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel bunch. And they'll shy away from the book. I go, hey, you're the marketing folks. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go along with you on that. So they changed it to Fearless Prayer. Uh, uh, 
before they made the change, though, I, I said, look, let me do this. Let me, I, I've got about 4,000, you know, Facebook friends. Let me, uh, let me send out a note there. Just take a little poll and see how this goes. So I did that. I, I sent out a, a poll to all my Facebook people and just said, hey, I have a book coming out, and here are the two possible titles. I didn't give much background at all. I just said, without, my, without any commentary, i just like to know which one, if you were to see on a bookshelf in a Christian bookstore, which one would most intrigue you? And so I sent this out, and, it, uh, and Facebook, you know, rumbled for a few days. Um, uh, and, bing, out came the answer. It was 20 to 1. 20 to 1! Uh, against the title that I had originally picked. Uh, ask for anything, and it will be done for you. They go, yeah, that just sounded too much like that crazy stuff on Christian television. You know? And I go, okay, good, good call marketing team. So it ends up being fearless prayer, why we don't ask and why we should. But it also showed us something very important that mainstream evangelicals like us, we're reading the Bible and we get to John chapter 15, verse 7. It's just full of amazing promises for us, and yet we shy away from it. Why? Because, because there's people who abuse it out there. Well, I have an answer for that one. I have an answer for this particular problem. Um, I'm just going to ignore them, for goodness sakes. There's, here's a promise from God. Right? And if understood properly, it's just, it's, it's, off the, it's off the tracks, this, this, this amazing promise, right? Again, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. All right? So that's, that's objection number one, the word faith we've been standing between us and properly embracing this verse and ignoring the abuses of it. I'm not going to let them rob me of something wonderful like this. And in my view, it really is wonderful. The second thing that, that, that blocks our uh, in fully embracing this particular passage and promise, uh, uh, as one pastor rightly knows, he goes, hey, you have to and be careful of that. Yeah, and you have to recognize that it's a conditional. It's a conditional. If if we abide in him, and if his words abide in us, then all that cool stuff happens. Right? I go, okay, got it. And so I've, I really just uh, thought about that for several months as I talked with my, my Christian colleagues at Viola and uh, pastors on the road and, uh, you know, really the top-level Bible teachers and all that. And, and I started to think, uh, that just the, the average Christian, I think, fulfills this conditional marvelously. I mean, look at you. It's going to be a beautiful day out there. It's Labor Day, and here we find you sitting in a, a you know, in, a, in an elementary school. You actually have to set up the chairs yourself, for goodness sakes. And, uh, and you think this is great. Why? So that you can hear the Word of God proclaimed. So that you can learn how to, to live for God in a bigger and better way. Uh, so you are definitely abiding in him. I don't really think there's a question about that. You are, you are just by being here, you're abiding in him. And I go to churches like this all the time, and there's all kinds of people who are abiding in him. And by the way, abide is not a scary word. It simply means remain. You're, you're, you're kind of locked in with Jesus, right? You're kind of locked in with him. You know, you, you, you've been around the block, and you know there's nobody else who's going to hold a candle to what Jesus is teaching. So you're here, and you've, you've really uh, pulled out the stops to make this work. And you, you, his, word abide, his words abide in you as well. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but man, I, listen, I listen to Bible teaching on the radio all the time. You know, I'm kind of, uh, I did that when I was a very young Christian, and now as an older Christian, I, I, I've gotten back to it. I just love the Bible teaching. Uh, that they set forth on most of these radio stations. I really enjoy it. But I noticed the other day, I'm, I'm just constantly filled with the Word and good preaching and teaching. And some of you, you read the Bible voraciously. You read it for yourself, for your own spir spiritual growth. You read it to your family. You quote it at the dinner table. You read it to your grandkids. And uh, you're, just, you're just kind of wild-eyed about Jesus and the stuff you believe it's true, and you show that with every mo move you make including uh, when you're hearing his words and you're putting those into action. 
So by any measure, I think you fulfill the conditional. You are abiding in him, and his words are abiding in you. That doesn't mean everybody in this room is doing that, or anybody, every person in every church. But there are so many I've bumped into now in these warm, vibrant, evangelical churches that I think, uh, by and large, the Christian community does abide in him. And we want his words to, do, to abide in us. So that's the conditional. And I think we passed that. Well, here's the third barrier that blocks people's access to the full promise here that Jesus is giving us. And that is, it's a, it's a worldview. And we can't help having this worldview. We're, we're kind of, we're just immersed in this. But the worldview is naturalism. Naturalism. I mean, if you really want a big definition of this, you can go to, go online, go to the Stanford Dictionary of Philosophy, and they'll, they'll go on for 10 pages talking about what a worldview is, and especially the worldview of naturalism. Uh, I'll give you a, a simple definition. It's, it's simply this, that uh, if you're immersed in naturalism, you're really not expecting supernatural things to happen in your life. It's really being skeptical of supernatural activity. Uh, we've got a real problem with that. We're not very good at embracing the supernatural. Uh, sometimes, too, because it's abused in other circles, we, we tend to stay away from it. But there, there really is uh, an immensely powerful, all-loving, <laughs> supreme being who is invisible, uh, but is re as real as can be, and loves us to death, and is very attentive and wonderful to us, but he's supernatural. And he likes to do supernatural things if we're open to such things. So, uh, naturalism is a big problem. One of my colleagues in the apologetics department at Biola wrote this. He goes, naturalism is subtle, and most of us don't even recognize its pervasive influences on us as evangelicals. Yet, if left untreated, it will utterly destroy us. The problem is this, the evangelical churches in the West have been so deeply influenced by naturalism that we have essentially been de-supernaturalized. By and large, we have lost the power and presence of the Lord that is promised in Scripture so that, to a dangerous degree, we are living in our own strength. I think he's right on the money with that. So we're, we've been de-supernaturalized. We just don't have that mindset. I don't have any any great answer to that except for a couple of obvious ones, you know, to, to, to read the scriptures more often and, and talk about, talk more openly with, with your family and with your Christian friends about the supernatural things that God is doing in your life. I think that'll help uh, uh, bring it up more often and make it more real in our lives. And, uh, and it doesn't hurt at all, of course, to pray. To pray for God to give you a big uh, breath of Fresh supernatural air. You know? Just take a deep breath and go, I want to see some, some wild stuff today, God. I know you can do this, but it would require a supernatural act, and I'm ready. Sometimes the supernatural acts happen. We don't mention them. We, we think we think it's it's probably more impressive like never to say that. In fact, I was I was doing a conference up uh, up in Northern California and uh, this uh, dear brother was in the green room with us, and we were chatting, and he was, uh, uh, and uh, what, one of my colleagues there speaking was J.P. Moreland, you know, one of the top 50 philosophers on the planet, you know, and this guy, uh, he's, he just happened to, we just talk, started talking about miracles, and this guy said, oh, I had a miracle one time. He's really reluctant, we had to kind of, you know, push him to tell us what was going on. He goes, yeah, uh, you know, I'm a mechanic, and a big machine just fell on my arm, shattered it completely. I mean, I was probably not going to be able to use that arm again. Uh, now, there were some people praying for me, but I went to the doctor the next day after having, you know, the, the x-rays were absolutely conclusive that this thing was shattered in, you know, a hundred different places, and was probably not going to be usable at all. Uh, after, after prayer, I had to go back to the doctor. They did another x-ray, and it was completely put back together. And... Uh, Moreland and I go, whoa, man, what did the church do? And then he goes, well, I really haven't told him yet. <laughs> <laughs> and J.P. Moreland's famous for this line. <coughs> you idiot! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And, and so we, we put them in a headlock and said, you've got to tell people. So there's things like that happening in our midst, and we don't even know about them. And so our, our view of the supernatural is deflated quite dramatically. So that's a problem. Uh, oh, I got another example here. So I had a student, his name was Kojo, he's, he's from Ghana. He came to the United States to study apologetics so that he could be you know, useful to the Lord in, in you know, uh, presenting the gospel and answering tough questions about it, uh, especially as he did uh, evangelical ministry on the uh, outskirts of towns and so on. So he was doing a set of uh, revival meetings in Ghana, and... Uh, and after that was done, he came to the United States, as missionaries tend to do, he came to the United States, and, and he came out to visit me to, to kind of report what the Lord had been doing. And so he's telling me about these uh, uh, evangelistic meetings they were doing in the countryside. He's like, yeah, so we were, in one, we were in one town, and we prayed real hard for this guy, and, uh, and, and yeah, I think... I mean, he came to know the Lord. It was just glorious. Then his whole family comes to know the Lord. Then we had an opportunity to speak in front of the, uh, uh, the parliament in Ghana. Oh, man, what a, what a time that was. The Lord just kicked the door open for that one. And then we were out in another town. And, uh, oh, yeah, in this town, uh, this woman, uh, just as we're starting the meeting, comes in carrying this small child, small boy, brings him up and, and puts him on the little stage that we had built for the revival meeting. And... Um, so we knelt, we kneeled down and we just fervently prayed, and uh, the kid opens his eyes and comes back to life. He was definitely dead. And then Kojo says, "Well, then we went to the next town." And so I'm like, "Whoa, Kojo, back the train up." <laughs> what happened? And and he he explains, you know, he, he didn't know much about what happened. They prayed, and the kid comes back to life. I go, "Okay." Go, oh, Joe, uh, we've known each other for a long time. How come, how come we don't see that kind of thing in North America? He kind of laughed at me. I can't believe you're asking that. You're the head of the apologetics group. You should, you should know answers to those things. Uh, well, help, help me out. Just give me your, your idea on this. He goes, well, part of the problem is you have 911. <laughs> you have 911. You see, uh, when, when something tragic happens, uh, some medical incident, or you're in imminent danger or something, uh, uh, you might pray, uh, but, but chances are you're running to get your phone, you know, so that you can dial. And, and we don't have 911, you know, in, in Ghana. So that's a, uh, that's a problem. And so, uh, so what we do is we tend to pray, because that's our, that is our lifeline. And we pray, and not everybody is healed. Not every danger is averted, not, not, not even by a long shot. But I guarantee we see a lot more supernatural activity than you do, simply because we're so inclined toward prayer. I mean, it's, it's our first recourse, our first, I mean, something's going wrong, we cry out to God. And it made a lot of sense to me. So that was the third one. There's a fourth barrier, a fourth barrier to accessing this amazing promise of Jesus in John chapter 15. And... Uh, it's really not much of a barrier. It's really a, a help. But, but uh, it's understanding there's a context to this passage. It, just, it doesn't sit in isolation. There's a context for it. And the context is the, the vine and branches discourse of our Lord. Right? Uh, you are the, I am the vine and you are the branches, he says. This all starts up in John chapter 15, verse 5. By the way, you need to remember that when Jesus was speaking these words in John chapter 15, he was hours away from his trial and his uh, execution on the cross. These were the words he wanted to give to his closest followers uh, just before his demise. So, and, and you can imagine, he, he, he wanted to make sure that they understood these things because this was going to be a critical lifeline for their ministry. But here's what it says in John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, or abide in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And, and then there's a, a final verse, 8, where it says, this is kind of a crescendo for this whole uh, pericope, this whole Bible story of Jesus. Um, he says, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Uh, uh, Jesus, even in his last hours on, on the planet, is kind of giddy sharing this. this. This is an amazing secret to the whole operation. It's to his Father's glory that we bear much fruit. And that's the context. For this. It's about fruit bearing. It's about fruit bearing. Uh, it's not... Somebody said, hey, uh, I mean, so you're talking about you're asking for anything. What if I ask for a ski chalet in Aspen? I go, go for it. You totally should. I encourage people to pray even for crazy things. Uh, he goes, do you think I'll get it? I go, no. <laughs> no. But, but it says, ask for anything. But yeah, look, I want you to ask because anytime you ask God for something, you're opening the channels of communication, right? You're kind of like on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, you know, uh, you know oh, open up a line of communication with the other spaceship. And, and guess what? Once that line is open, you know, God, God gets a chance to speak to you as much as you get to speak to him. And so he, he can actually maybe adjust your thoughts, you know, especially since when you told me you wanted a ski chalet in house and you said, it's just for me. I'm not inviting any of my family members. I'm putting a sign outside that says, no Jehovah's Witnesses. It's going to be pure as the snow in Aspen, man. Just me. I go, yeah, I don't think the Lord's going to give you that, but, you know, he might. And he might teach you some wild lessons, you know, with, with your ski chalet in Aspen. I don't know. Uh, but he, he really does want to hear from us. And here's one other critical issue that's involved in all this. And some people find this the most refreshing thing of all. Prayer, there's a lot of misunderstanding about prayer. Prayer, uh, let, me, let me just read a quote. It's actually from the book. Page, page 28, I'm quoting somebody else here, so it's cool. Uh, prayer is asking. Did you know that? Some people don't think prayer is asking. I'll get to that. Prayer is asking. You can qualify this statement if you need to by saying prayer is asking in a relationship. Prayer is asking in a conversation. Prayer is asking with the goal of making us mature in Christ. Prayer is asking while being conformed to God's will and so on. But in essence, after all the add-ons are factored in, prayer is asking. In his book on prayer, J.I. Packer wrote, quote, but at the core, where all people of prayer bend their knees, prayer is asking, begging God to supply felt needs. In a broad sense, asking is the very essence of praying. Uh, Dallas Willard, great Christian thinker, concurred. He said, quote, the picture of, of prayer that emerges from the life and teachings of Jesus in the Gospels is quite clear. Basically, it is one of asking, requesting things from God. Uh, surely the most authoritative word on prayer comes from Jesus himself when he responds to one of his disciples' requests, teach us to pray. Jesus then teaches them what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And as scholars have pointed out through the centuries, the Lord's Prayer is a set of six requests, six asks, directing, directed to our Heavenly Father. Prayer is fundamentally asking, since this is true based on the authority of Jesus himself, and since prayer is so central to a dynamic life with God, it makes sense for us to learn how to ask, to ask regularly, fearlessly, sincerely, expectantly, and humbly for his hand to move in our lives in all the right ways. Prayer is asking. Uh, one, one more thing along these lines. Richard Foster, in his book on prayer, got something very important. Uh, down on paper, and I want to share it with you. Uh, prayer is asking. Okay, we're, let's say we're in agreement with that. Some of you are finding that a bit of a challenge. Like, that's not exactly what I thought prayer was. I thought prayer was sitting quietly before God and, and having him speak to me. 
Uh, that's part of it, certainly. Uh, that there's confession and all that. Those are all parts of prayer. You can bring those in whenever you'd like. But at the center of it all is asking. God, God wants us in that posture to be asking him for things, that, that, that posture of dependence. Richard Foster notices that some people go astray on that particular idea. And he says this, some have suggested that while the less discerning will continue to appeal to God for aid, the real masters of the spiritual life, he's saying that tongue in cheek, go beyond petition to adoring God's essence with no needs or requests whatever. In this view, our asking represents a more crude and naive form of prayer, while adoration and contemplation are a, are a more enlightened and high-minded approach, since they are free from any egocentric demands. Uh, Foster says, this I submit to you is a false spirituality. Petitionary prayer, that is asking God for stuff, remains primary throughout our lives because we are forever dependent upon God. It is something we never really get beyond, nor should we want to. The Bible itself is full of petitionary prayer and unabashedly recommends it to us. Prayer is asking. It has a lot of other things, too. You can do lots of things in prayer. But don't hesitate to ask. Some people have come up to me and said, that's, that was the most freeing part of the message you gave. Like, uh, that, that I, can, I can really just ask for anything. Do it. Because even if you're asking amiss, God will correct it. And, and he'll, he'll come alongside and, and put you on the right path. He wants to see people who are dependent on him and open to him and looking to him for the answers. And looking to him for to fulfill their needs. All of those things are, are just key. And don't forget, in John 15, says, if you abide in me, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And then verse 8, again, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's as if he's standing outside the doors in the back right now with baskets full of things that you need to move his kingdom forward, to bear his fruit in profound ways. But that's what he's interested in. It's not about getting your ski lodge in Aspen. It's about bearing his fruit. It's about pushing his kingdom forward. And in that context, if that's what you are about, take it to the bank. You can ask for anything, and he will do it for you. That's the context. That was the missing piece, and we should know that to be the case. Listen to this. Theologians have trouble finding words to describe the promise in John 15, 7, and similar passages in John 14 and Matthew 7. Uh, my colleague Klaus Zissler, who has had st who studied these passages carefully, writes, quote, in response to this promise from Jesus in John 15, 7, scholars use words such as staggering, breathtaking, startling, and astonishing. J.I. Packer wrote that Jesus, in his farewell discourse to the apostles, spoke more than once of making requests to the Father in his name, with astounding promises attached. Packer says, amazing, but that's what Jesus said, and all his words are true. The famous prayer servant George Mueller put it this way, our difficulty seems to be this, the promise is so exceedingly great that we cannot conceive God really to mean what he clearly appears to have revealed. The blessing seems so vast for our comprehension, we stagger at the promises. I've got to give you one example of this. i got about 50 of them, but I'll give you one. I just quoted George Mueller. I'm going I'm to give a little bit of a rundown on a, on a quick episode in his life. George Mueller is a legend in the realm of prayer and trusting God. If you've never heard of him, I'm delighted to introduce you to him. If you do know him already, I'm happy to remind you about him. It would be a, I would be negligent not including at least a word about him in a book like this. Mueller started several homes for orphans in Bristol, England. His first was opened in 1836 for 30 children. And by 1870, he was caring for over 2,000 children. 
He was a man of prayer who documented in diaries around 50,000 prayers. 30, this is important. 30,000 of which were answered within 24 hours of the request being made. I found that to be the case. God is like Johnny on the spot. He loves to hear our requests, and he loves to blow our minds by answering so many of them in a fast fashion. Mueller is known to have run a range of orphanages and other ministries without ever asking anybody for money. One of his legendary answers to prayer took place outside, uh, well, took place around 1861 in Bristol, England, and is recorded firsthand by his daughter's recorded firsthand by his colleague's daughter, Abigail Townsend. Abigail was playing in a garden near the orphanage when Mueller came out, took her by the hand, and said, come and see what our father will do. Abigail recounts entering a long dining room with empty plates, cups, and bowls lining the table. All the children of the orphanage were standing around the table waiting for breakfast. What Abigail did not know at the time was that there was not a morsel of food in the house. Children, you know that what we must be on time for school, said Mueller. And lifting his hand, he prayed, Dear Father, we thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. Not moments later, there was a knock at the door. It was a baker who said to Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast, and the Lord wanted me to send you some. So I got up at 2 o'clock, baked some fresh bread, and then brought it. A second knock soon thereafter. Uh, this time it was the milkman. Mueller, my milk cart has broken down outside the orphanage. I'd like to give the children the cans of fresh milk so that they can empty the wagon and repair it. They thanked the baker and the milkman, and they all enjoyed their breakfast. Now here's my author's conclusion on this episode. In Mueller's mind, there was simply no way that God would not do this. There was simply no way that God would not do this. Have you ever been in a, in a kingdom building situation a, uh, you know, where, where, where you had an opportunity to really push the kingdom forward or to bear significant fruit for the Lord? Uh, whenever I'm in a situation like that, I go, oh, what's the Lord going to do? Because he's going to do something. Based on this promise of Jesus, something's going to happen. And I, I just want to... I just want to be an eyewitness. I want to be up close and personal when it does, because it's going to be something. And I, I think that's what Mueller was thinking here. In Mueller's mind, there was simply no way that God would not do this. Oh, well, I can keep going for a long time, but I better stop there. Eh? Oh, maybe we should pray. <laughs> our Heavenly Father, our great King, what a joy it is to know you. What a joy it is to know that you didn't leave us stranded in our own time without a tremendous witness, a, a trail of evidence leading back through history, testifying to what you did on our behalf. We, we can't thank you enough. But you also left us with this amazing promise. Oh, Lord, thank you for that. And I pray that my brothers and sisters would explore these ideas this week through prayer. And when they see something that's obviously a kingdom move, <coughs> something that's uh, bears fruit in dramatic ways for the Lord Jesus Christ that they pray fervently and then expect to see you move. Uh, Father, what a promise. We don't deserve any of this, but there it sits. And you, you're communicating these ideas to us hours before your trial and your execution. You care for us that much. Fill us with your spirit. Give us a vision to see these things played out in the weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you.